to uh, the second annual So You Think You Can Lawyer presentation um, converted to a webinar based on the conditions outside um, and these unprecedented times that we find ourselves in. Uh, we look forward to providing you with some good information and hope you enjoy. Before we get the presentation formally started, um, being a lawyer, you know, I have to provide a disclaimer on behalf of the organization. Um, but just wanted to make you aware that this presentation has been prepared for informational purposes only and is not offered, nor should it be, nor should it be construed as legal advice on any specific fact or circumstances. The contents of this presentation are intended for general informational purposes only and do not reflect the views of the Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation, PIDC, its subsidiaries or affiliates. You are urged to engage and consult your own attorney with any questions that you may have. So I wanted to start off with a presentation overview just because the goal of this presentation is to provide all of our attendees here today with advice and guidance on researching attorneys, understanding the legal market in Philadelphia, and maximizing your attorney experience in a time when every dollar counts. Um, we talk a lot about the economic loss that has been suffered by businesses um, trying to deal with the restrictions on their operations and just the reduction in economic activity um, as a result of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. And we think that the information that you will receive today will help you um, at least think about how to maximize the time that you spend with attorneys because they are the ones that will be advising you um, through this very difficult time. And we just wanted to say that we empathize with the business owners as well. Uh, many business owners are essentially facing issues that no workbook, no prior business experience, um, nothing could really prepare you for um, in this lifetime. And we just hope that the advice on this, that is presented during this webinar um, helps you move forward as you try to do the best you can to maintain your business operations through this time. So first, I'm going to start with the introduction of myself. Um, as Marla mentioned for me before, my name is Tariq Brooks. I am the Vice President and Assistant General Counsel at PIDC. Um, I graduated from Cheney University for my undergraduate degree, and I graduated from Rutgers Camden School of Law for my Juris Doctorate. Um, my specialties include finance and lending. Um, I, support all of the financing operations at PIDC, um, from closing through the workout and restructuring phases. I uh, generally also specialize in corporate and business law and also have experience with mergers and acquisitions. So whether it's buy side or sell side, um, I can help businesses that are going through the sale of their business or the purchase of another business. Um, and also businesses that are looking to merge with each other. So after this, I'm going to introduce the next panelist, uh, Cheryl Axelrod of the Axelrod Firm, and just have her give us a few minutes um, to tell us about herself and her specialties and experience. Cheryl? Thank you, Tariq. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank all the folks at PIDC, yourself included, for inviting me to participate in today's wonderful program with my fellow esteemed panelists, um, all of you, including Tariq, of course. Um, so uh, I own the Axelrod firm. It's a small woman-owned firm. We have offices in Philadelphia and Washington, DC. Um, as you see on the screen, I went to Temple uh, University School of Law I'm a former president of the Temple Law Alumni Association, the fourth woman to hold that post in its nearly 100 year history. I graduated from Brandeis University uh, as a 
as an undergrad, my um, background, my major at the time uh, that I went to undergrad was um, economics. So my specialties are representing business owners and serving as a arbitrator and mediator. So just quickly, with regard to my representation of uh, business owners, employers, also governmental entities and nonprofits, um, a whole array of business owners, we represent them in their business disputes, commercial litigation, um, usually fairly larger size uh, kinds of disputes, um, non-union employment matters of all sizes, and in bodily injury matters of all sizes. Um, and in the ADR, alternative dispute resolution ADR kind of work, I serve as a mediator and arbitrator. So um, in the Court of Common Pleas of Philadelphia, there are less than 130 people who have made the list to serve as judges pro tempore and help, which basically means as a judge, to help parties resolve their disputes in business litigation. And I'm one of them, and I'm very proud of that. I love doing that kind of work. Um, and I serve- Carol, can I, can I inter interrupt you for a moment? You're going in and out. Oh, okay. Um, All right. I, I don't know where to start from, but um, when did I start going in and out? It's, it's, it's fine if you start under your specialties. Okay, so redoing my specialties quickly. Um, I represent employers and I help them through their uh, business disputes, so commercial litigation disputes. Usually these are fairly large disputes. I would say from usually $200,000 and above is when they usually come to me. Um, through all sizes of non-union employment matters. So these are employment discrimination cases, Family Medical Leave Act cases, uh, whistleblower cases and the like, single plaintiff, in other words, a single person has made the claim, um, and in bodily injury matters of all sizes. So in those two types, the employment and bodily injury, I defend uh, the employers in that and provide all sorts of counseling and advice, um, even outside of those claims, but related to employment or bodily injury work. And then um, I serve as a mediator and an arbitrator. So um, there are less than 130 people, attorneys in the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that have made the list of judges pro tempore, which means that you can help parties as a officer of the court serving as a judge resolve their commercial disputes. And I'm one of those people on the list, which I'm very proud of. You have to impress the three judges on the Commerce Court bench uh, enough to make the list to show that You've tried enough cases in front of them. You have good judgment. You get along well with people. You understand case value. Um, and so I do quite a fair amount of that. And I can help all um, folks with all sizes of disputes, commercial litigation disputes, resolve their disputes and come to a settlement. Um, and I'm always happy to do that. Uh, and I serve as a AAA arbitrator. AAA is the American Arbitration Association. It's the gold standard for arbitrations. And in that, um, arena, I help, um, I, I serve as the judge and I decide the arbitration. So uh, for those of you who are business owners and don't want to get involved in longstanding litigation, consider whether you're the party that you're adverse to is interested in trying to resolve this and save everybody a lot of money. And then if you are, I would love to hear from you and help all the parties settle their cases. Great. Thanks, Cheryl, for that information. Um, next, we'll go to Angela Middleton. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Tariq. Um, so I think that as my slide here uh, indicates, I am uh, an associate at the law firm of Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lear, uh, which is in the same building as PIDC, right at 15th and Market. Um, personally, I'm a Philadelphia native, uh, born and raised uh, in North Philadelphia, so it's exciting to practice law in my hometown uh, of the city of brotherly love. Um, I went to, as the slide indicates, uh, University of Pennsylvania for my undergraduate uh, degree and then on to Rutgers School of Law Camden, where I met our fearless leader here, Tariq, 
Uh, so it's nice, nice to uh, still be working with him in this capacity. Um, so at Saw Ewing, my uh, specialties are litigation and investigations, actually, and that, that's my fault for uh, not having Tariq update this slide uh, appropriately. Um, but commercial litigation, we often, often think of it as an active lawsuit, right? Either you've been sued uh, or you're looking to sue someone, file a lawsuit against someone, uh, but not always. Uh, sometimes it's preventative. Uh, and so some of my work and some of my firm's work in the litigation uh, space is dealing with counseling clients, corporate clients on best practices, right? How do we get to two or three steps before a lawsuit might be filed to make sure uh, that it doesn't happen or that if it happens, we're in the best position possible to, to raise a valid defense. Um, and so in addition to actually litigating uh, a case or trying a lawsuit, which is the fun stuff, we like to do that, of course, but also want to save our clients some money and avoid litigation completely. Um, so under the litigation uh, umbrella, I have a few different specialties, um, employment, ERISA, and white collar. So under employment, I do a lot of what Cheryl uh, just described. Uh, which is um, litigation as far as discrimination is concerned. Um, uh, most often we're on the defense of those cases. I don't, I can't think of an instance where we've been on the offensive and an employment litigation matter. Um, so it's almost always an uh, defensive matter. Uh, under ERISA, what we handle is mostly disability litigation, um, either long-term or short-term. Uh, there have been a just a real real growth spurt in ERISA litigation over the past several years due to regulations on a federal level um, and employers have worked really hard to make sure that they are following regulations and implementing them in the best way possible um, still that doesn't really always help avoid litigation and so we have a very active ERISA litigation uh, practice that falls under our insurance practice group and then under the white collar umbrella, um, what I do is both litigation and investigations. Um, there really has been, a, 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 again, a real growth spur over the past several years, um, not just of defending corporations or corporate um, employees and investigations by the federal or state level governments, but also corporations conducting internal investigations uh, when there is um, a concern that there might be some type of discrimination or fraud or other type of unethical or illegal behavior occurring in their own house. And they want to make sure that they are doing the best that they can, taking the best that, uh, that they can to find out what's going on um, and, and act accordingly. And so my firm and I do a, a really fair amount, a really great amount of um, investigation work in the white collar space um, and in other spaces just for internal investigations overall. Awesome, thanks Angela. And last but not least, we have our final panelist, uh, Matt Meltzer. So Matt, feel free to give us, you know, a few minutes to um, talk about yourself and your specialty, so on and so forth. Sure. Thank you, Tariq. Um, and I'll mention that Tariq and I were previously colleagues at Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath, <coughs> excuse me, which effective February 1st became Fagery, Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath. We actually merged with uh, the law firm you may know of, um, Fagery, Baker, Daniels. They have a very strong Midwestern presence. We had a strong East Coast and West Coast presence. And as a merger of equals, we now have a strong presence on both coasts uh, in the Midwest and in London and um, China. Uh, may not be the, the best place to be at the moment, but we have offices there. Um, my education background, I went to school um, at Radnor High School, so I'm a local, went to Swarthmore. Um, then bolted from the Mid-Atlantic to go to law school down in Nashville, Tennessee. And I am a tax generalist. I love tax. Most people think I'm crazy for having that passion, but those of us who love it really, really love it. Um, as a practitioner, my focus is as a generalist. So 
I do a mix of federal and a mix of state tax. Uh, my federal tax exposure is mostly in the transactional tax space. So that's mergers and acquisitions. As Tariq said, that's when a business wants to acquire another business or a business wants to sell itself or sell its assets to another business. Um, joint ventures involve two businesses undertaking a specific project together. Um, I also happen to be fortunate enough to work with the national expert in like-kind exchanges of real estate, which is very interesting because we get to work with clients of all shapes and sizes. We've done deals with properties worth under a million dollars for real estate ventures consisting of one to two investors. And we've done like-kind exchanges for publicly traded REITs with portfolios of $1.2 billion worth of property in a single transaction. Um, so that's a lot of fun. I really get to work with a lot of different kinds of people in that work. Um, as a state and local tax planning and uh, specialist and litigator, I help folks stay current with their state compliance obligations. So you, let's say you have recently acquired a business and the business performs services in various states. You need to know whether those services are taxable in those states. Some states will tax certain services. Some states don't tax any services at all. And most people think that federal tax is where all the dollars are. Well, when you actually look under the microscope, the, the state tax, and especially the local tax, if any of you have dealt with the Philadelphia Realty Transfer Tax, you know that the state and local can drive the bus. It's not always the federal that you have to be worried about. Um, as a litigator, I've got several matters pending at various stages, the Pennsylvania tax agencies, so that would be the Board of Appeals, the Board of Finance and Revenue, and we're also litigating a very large matter before the Pennsylvania Commonwealth Court. We're hoping to get a decision this year, but due to the coronavirus, we might have to wait a bit longer to get a resolution on that one. Um, I'm also the firm's resident expert on all matters relating to employment tax, mm -hmm. so I get a lot of calls from clients around this time of year saying, help, you know, we issued 2,000 W-2s with the wrong information on it, what do we do? Um, usually those, those problems seem awful on the front end, but the, the resolutions are usually typically easy, and it's, it's a great way to play the hero. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks for that, Matt. So it's interesting that you guys all work at different size law firms, and the next slide presents the different tiers of law firms um, in the Philadelphia market and even nationally and internationally. Um, in case you don't know, law firms are typically broken down into tiers based on certain characteristics. Um, those characteristics can include number of attorneys, number of professionals, maybe even annual revenue. A client's experience, however, can differ at each law firm but understanding the law firm's tier can help you establish some baseline ideas about what to expect in your attorney client experience. I mean, here we have panelists at firms of each tier size. So I want, wanted to give them an opportunity to describe the experiences that a client will have at each, given, each respective firm. So I'm gonna start with Cheryl first. Um, Cheryl, where does your firm fit in this tiered system and who are some of your clients? Um, thanks, Tariq. So we're over at the far left with the solo practitioner small law firms, uh, six, lawyer, uh, six total people in my team going up to seven on Monday and we're hiring another associate, but we're still on the, on the small side. But um, in terms of our practice, we're very unusual for a small firm. Most small firms are handling smaller size cases and generally on the plaintiff side, the person who's bringing the lawsuit. Whereas at my firm, we are handling generally larger size cases and we are almost exclusively representing employers, the companies. So um, we're members of NAMWOLF, which is the National Association of Minority and Women-Owned Law Firms. Um, that distinction uh, is really hard to get. You have to um, 
all the attorneys in your firm have to have on average an AV rating, uh, AV preeminent, which is the highest rating that lawyers can get from Martindale Hubble, which is the um, rater, rater in, the, in the legal industry. Um, and you have to have at least three major clients. And by major, they're talking at least regional in size, if not national or global. Um, and they have to rave about you and they have to be current clients. So, and you have to have three or more lawyers. I mean, there's other uh, criteria as well. But um, so we're an unusual firm for, for a small firm um, in the sense of who we represent. Um, but as I said, we also handle the mediations, settlement um, mediations and arbitrations, and those can be of all sizes. And the firms and the companies that we can represent in those can be small to large. Um, my rates as compared to other mediators, it's just far lower. Um, most mediators are, for instance, uh, about $10,000 for a single day. Um, whereas I'll do an hourly rate, my normal hourly rate for that kind of work is four fifty an hour. So mm -hmm. I've, I've been growing that uh, business substantially as a result. Awesome. Thank you. So Angela, I'm going to turn to you next. Can you tell us more about where your firm fits and who are some of your clients? Sure. Uh, we are, uh, Saul Ewing, we are a mid-sized to large firm. Uh, we have about, um, I'm trying to not move because it looks like my trans, my virtual background here isn't cooperating, but hopefully it's not too distracting. Um, we have about 400, uh, 400 or so lawyers in various offices across, um, spanning from the East Coast, uh, mostly in the Northeast region, um, but down to um, Florida uh, on the East Coast and then as far West as Minnesota including uh, a fairly large office in Chicago. Um, and our office in Philadelphia is also pretty large, about 100 lawyers. Um, so we, uh, that, that's how many lawyers we have and why we're considered mid-size, um, because there are the conglomerates uh, that have twice as many lawyers as we do, uh, but also the very small, uh, small shops. Um, as far as client base, we actually have, uh, and this is, I think, unique to our size. Most firms our size really focus on large clients uh, and, and large corporate clients. That is our, probably the, the majority of our clients, but we also represent a fair amount of individual, uh, or not maybe not individuals, but um, smaller scale corporate clients. Um, we really don't discriminate as far as size is concerned. Um, I think we, it's more a matter of the type of case that we're working on, um, this type of client. We really want to focus on relationship building. Um, and we understand that there can be, uh, obviously, the larger companies are more likely to have larger scale cases, but that's not always true. Um, there are smaller companies that face large scale problems uh, similar to similar to larger clients. So we, we take uh, complex matters from clients of all sizes. Um, and I think those are all the questions I was supposed to ask in this one. Um, as far as the fees are concerned, I think that's also probably mid-range. Um, and I think we're going to talk a little later about specific types of fee agreements. Um, but I think we fall into the middle category in that, that way as well. Awesome, thanks, Angela. And then, how about you, Matt? Because you're more at a you're at a larger firm, and right. Last but not least, again, um, we we occupy the far right. Uh, we we are a law firm of thirteen hundred lawyers. Um, I think what do you call thirteen hundred lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? A running start. So that's kind of where we are. Um, our <laughs> clients are really they, we range the gamut, right? So uh, we, as Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath, we specialize in the middle market. And I think we're going to continue to do that as Fagree, Drinker, Biddle and Reef, but we represent a lot of Fortune 500 companies, but we also represent a lot of local businesses. As I mentioned before, in my real estate tax practice, I've represented ventures with three or four partners, um, folks looking to go their separate ways. So they use the like kind exchange of real estate transaction that I mentioned before as a way to do that. 
or they're just looking to exit one property and move into another. And, and the, you know, the rules are the same no matter what the size of the transaction is. And it's a fairly complicated set of rules. So you know, we really are able to carve out a niche for us to ourselves and, and be sort of the go-to in the Philadelphia market and even the national market for those types of transactions. Um, our office in Philadelphia is half litigation, half transactional. Uh, from a litigation point of view, we are we try to be commercial generalists, but we do sort of have a, um, a specialization in pharmaceutical um, litigation. We were involved in the recent Johnson & Johnson trial that you may have followed in the news that was um, litigated to verdict in um, the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas. Um, as far as areas of practice, dozens of areas, yeah, that's that's really what it is. I mean, we have tax lawyers, we have commercial litigators, we have intellectual property specialists. Um, unlike some other Philadelphia law firms, we don't have a cannabis group. Um, that hasn't been high on our list of priorities, but who knows, maybe that'll change as the, as the marketplace changes. Um, we have a franchise law practice, thanks to our new colleagues from the, the Fabry Baker Daniels firm. And I think we are trying to develop a sports law practice as well. But you know, what I love about being a tax lawyer is I, I get to work with everybody in the firm. I mean, whether you're, you have a, you're, it's a small client or a large client, you're going to have tax issues from, from cradle to grave. And, and I get to be a part of all that, which I, again, I just love tax law. I think it's, I think it's so cool. Mm -hmm. Understood. So in the event that there was a business owner, say like two, $3 million in revenue, trying to think about how to restructure or pivot their business to, and um, the tax implications of that, is that something that you would recommend that they reach out to you for, or is that something that wouldn't be in your, I guess your firm's sweet spot or skill set? Absolutely. Um, and of course, with with any engagement, and, and maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead in the in the list of things we're going to talk about, but you know, we always like to have an initial conversation with a potential client. What are you looking to do, and what are you looking to get from your attorney? Um, we like to have longitudinal relationships. I mean, it's nice to develop um, a professional relationship, often that blooms into a friendship, where you get to know the person's business, you get to know what their needs are down the road, you know, even before they start to think about things. Um, but, but that said, we've had people approach us on one-off deals. I recently just worked with a client who is a real estate developer in Boston. They had a closing on a property in North Philadelphia, and they needed some assistance in filing a Philadelphia realty transfer tax return. So we, we just, we did that as a one-off. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly, we always like to have that initial conversation, see if we can help. We talk about the fee. And if it's not going to work, we always try to, to recommend somebody that we know and trust. Fair enough. Fair enough. So this is important for our, um, attend, for our attendees because you can literally follow up an introduction, a question when you're introducing yourself to an attorney or meeting them for, for the first time. Um, you could follow up that what is your name question with what is your firm and what is your firm size and as you heard across um, our panelist descriptions some firms specialize in different things some firms are able to um, kind of some lawyers are able to extend their reach in a sense and connect you with different lawyers at their firm that might be able to handle your needs but this chart um, clearly lays out which you can expect from areas of practice to price range to attorney size, just by asking a lawyer that you meet, hey, what size firm are you at? Or what would you consider the size of your firm to be? So another question um, that I often get from business owners is where to find good lawyers? I mean, if you ask most lawyers, they will all say that they're good to some extent, right? But being able to research a lawyer before engaging them and spending your money with them is critical. I mean, on the slide, I have a list of resources that um, some of our business owners can use to properly research and diligence the attorney that they're thinking about engaging. 
Um, but I think it would be great to hear from you guys, um, our panelists, about where else you think lawyer, where else you think business owners may be able to go to meet lawyers like yourselves, or if they are out about and about in Philadelphia, where they're more likely to bump into you. So I'm gonna start with Angela here. Um, Angela, what resources should been do you think that business owners should utilize to search and research attorneys? And how would a business owner find you and learn more about the work that you do? Sure. So I'm looking at the list that you have here, uh, and I think generally the internet is wonderful. It's a great resource for a lot of different reasons. Um, but that actually would not be my first go-to uh, to find a lawyer. And I, the reason I, I say that is I'm thinking about um, the websites where you might find me, right? Again, mm -hmm. assuming that I would call myself a good lawyer or the, the lawyers in my firm a good one. Um, I don't know that you would find me on Avo. I don't know that you would find me on Yelp uh, or most lawyers for that matter. Um, especially when you get to the uh, lawyers who practice at midsize and large firms. Um, bar associations, I think, can be very helpful. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to attend a bar association event. It could be just a matter of picking up the phone and calling the bar association and saying, this is my problem, this is my issue, I'm looking for a referral, who can you send me to? Um, surprisingly, or maybe surprisingly to some of your uh, attendees, that can be a really helpful resource. Um, also, a lot of the more uh, prominent attorneys in the city, especially in Philadelphia, are active in the Bar Association. Uh, and so they, maybe they're not listed in a directory somewhere, but someone at the Bar Association may know them uh, and might be a top of mind person that they would refer you to. Um, so from this list here, I think Bar Associations would be um, the first, the first go-to if you don't personally know one. Mm -hmm. Word of mouth can be an extremely great resource, but I would follow that up with informed word of mouth, right? You don't want just a lawyer that someone knows. Right? You want to ask questions about what do you know about them? What type of work do you know that they engage in? Uh, do you know anything about the cases that they've handled? Um, just like you wouldn't necessarily go to a doctor or a car salesman or anyone else just because another person knows them, you wanna ask informed questions about them. Um, and for that reason, networking can be another great opportunity. Um, lawyers are very involved, especially the very uh, business savvy lawyers are very involved in trade associations that may not be focused on attorney membership, but because they're looking or we're looking to meet people who are in the industries where we practice, we might attend a trade association event or might be a member of a trade association and be listed in a directory um, and you might be able to find us there. Awesome. Can I answer now one? one? Yeah, um, one other thought I had is Googling for client alerts. So lawyers love to write. You know, they, they, we like to talk and we like to write. And if there's a particular topic that you have an interest in or you've come across in the course of your business, say you've just started a new business, you're structuring it as a partnership, you want to contribute all of the assets and you've got a couple of folks that you want to come in as partners with you, but they're not going to be contributing anything and you want to give them what's called a profits interest. Well, you might want to find a lawyer in Philadelphia who has particular expertise in that field. So. You know, you do what anybody does when they research a complicated issue. You go to Google, you put in the, the keywords, profits, interest, lawyer, Philadelphia, and see if anybody's published on it. And then if the names come up and folks have, have, have published on it, you read their article, you think, okay, this person sounds like a human, pick up the phone, give them a call and, and have a conversation. And despite appearances, lawyers really do like to help people, uh, at least tax lawyers, this tax lawyer likes to help people. So even if it's not something that I can help you with, I, I'm always very glad to make a referral or give names and, and help you find someone who would who'd be able to work with you. Matt, I think that's, that's a great point. And I just wanna, if I can quickly interject, there were two resources that I forgot to mention. Um, social media, uh, LinkedIn particularly, as the professional social media. 
um, is a great place to find if you if someone gives you the name of an attorney that they would recommend to you. LinkedIn is a great place to find those types of subject matter articles that they may have written about um, or other, just find more out about this person. Um, also a firm's website, especially for law firms like the Axelrod firm, like Drinker, like my firm. Uh, we really go to great lengths to make sure that our websites reflect uh, not just our educational background, but also uh, writings, articles that we've published, speaking engagements that we might have coming up or even that we've done in the past. Uh, and if you Google any one of our names and go to our bio pages on our, uh, web, our law firm's websites, you should be able to find that information. Great, thank you. And that is one that I'm actually going to um, add to the slide. Sometimes we make our, pre our slide presentations available for attendees and anyone that is just visiting our website that wants to know more information. But I think that the LinkedIn one is, a, um, is definitely a key one to add. And thanks, Matt, for your suggestions as well about um, researching client alerts from attorneys based on the subject that you are interested in receiving help with. Can I ask one, add one little thing? Oh, also, sure, sure. The only other thing I would add, because they, they covered so much, is also if you do know a lawyer, um, you it would be a good idea to ask them who to go to. And we are a small community, um, and we know the people in the community who are good at what they do. So I'm constantly referring people to other folks, right? We have three lawyers. We don't handle every sort of work. I listed what it is we do. Um, so for folks that are outside of what we do, I'm constantly referring them to other people. And these are people I know and people I trust and who are very good and can help, uh, work for other folks. So um, we're a great resource to, to just go to other lawyers and ask us who we think we should go to. That is a great point, Cheryl. Thanks for adding that in. So now that we've made it past the research phase, we, we understand who the lawyer is that, we, that a business owner is looking to interact with or engage with, we then move to the engagement letter, which is the outline of the attorney-client relationship. It's the, essentially the contract that a business owner would enter into with the lawyer when they want to engage them for a matter or use the lawyer's services. So here I have some of the provisions that are typically included in an engagement letter, including the scope of the services and representation, the length of the relationship, of course the fees, how the relationship will be terminated or concluded, and some, some of the standard contract terms and bullet play terms that you may see. Um, so Matt, what are some of the considerations for a business owner when negotiating an engagement letter, and what are some of the thing, what are some of the things that they should be particularly um, mindful of, mm -hmm. in your opinion? Sure. On your list of five items, I think numbers one and three are the most important to have very clearly spelled out in an engagement letter. So I'll start with number one: the scope of the services. Mm. I've seen in engagement letters that really match the scope of what is actually done in an engagement. And I've seen letters where it's just so open-ended and bland that you, that both the lawyer and the client are sort of like, huh, what, does this work actually fall under the engagement letter? Do we need a new engagement letter? So at the outset, have a thorough conversation um, with your lawyer about what it is you want them to do. Um, the intake process should be fulsome. Right? I mean, you want to make sure that you've told them what your situation is, what you're looking to get out of the representation. Um, if it is something that is intended to go on for an indeterminate amount of time, that's certainly fine. You know, we have a client that we've been working with now for about three years. It started as a one-off, but they've come back to us several times to continue the project that we started with them, and we've been able to do it under the same engagement letter. And the, the scope of the services was broadly defined as tax advice related to X project. Um, at, at the other end of the spectrum, you could have a one-off, like what I mentioned before. We had a client come to us and asked us to handle a Philadelphia and a Pennsylvania realty transfer tax matter um, after 
the deal had signed, which I'm going to get back to later on in the presentation because it's a great, great example of things not to do. Um, it, so if, if that's the intent of the parties that you, you're just going to work on this one discrete project together, say that. Be very specific. You've engaged Lawyer X to prepare Pennsylvania and Philadelphia realty transfer tax returns. That, that's a perfectly fine way to structure your letter. Um, one thing that doesn't necessarily belong in the engagement letter, but it's good for everybody to know is, uh, as, um, as I believe Cheryl mentioned, lawyers often work with other advisors. We work with accountants, we work with consultants, we work at lawyers with, with lawyers at other firms and other specialization areas. Um, it's good for everyone to know at the outset who's going to be working on what. So in an M&A deal, merger and acquisition transaction, we as the lawyers are responsible for preparing the purchase and sale agreement, but you're also going to have accountants involved who are quantifying various risks and doing the due diligence on the ground for the buyer about the target. Um, then you have the investment bankers who sort of oversee the process from a high level. So it's always good to know who's responsible for what. Um, and then number three, fees. I can only speak about my experience in a large law firm, but the fees are always higher. Um, that's just the nature of the beast. And most of the time your, your lawyers don't have a lot of flexibility to change the fee because it's set by a management committee. Um, it's just, just the way it is. And because the fees are high, it's always good to have a thorough conversation about what things are going to cost um, because nobody likes surprises. Lawyers hate to surprise clients with bills that are large because issues weren't anticipated at the outset or something that you thought was going to take eight hours took 40 hours. So it's good to have those kind of honest conversations at the front end so everybody knows what to expect. And I mean, and that completely makes sense. Um, Angela or Cheryl, do you guys have anything to add? I'm waiting for Angela first. I'm sorry. Oh, thanks, Cheryl. I, I would just add to, first of all, I think Matt covered the, the, the basics and the fundamentals and the, the most essential uh, aspects pretty well. I would just add to, um, you know, just quite simply, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, this really is, like I said, this is a relationship uh, and, and we are at, at our core, a service oriented industry. Um, and we want to make sure that you're happy with the service from beginning to end. And that includes the negotiation of the, um, of the fee agreement and the engagement letter. If there's something that you don't understand, you should absolutely, absolutely voice that concern. And don't be afraid to have another attorney. If there's a, an attorney who handles other types of work for you, look at it and discuss it with you. Um, it, it's not something that we're trying to hide or, or want to pull one over on you. Um, we want you to be comfortable uh, with everything at the outset. So don't be afraid to, to engage in that discussion as much as you need to in order to be comfortable. I would just add a, um, a few things. One is um, in the dialogue about the case, feel free to talk to the lawyer about who's going to do the bulk of the work, for instance. Is it going to be the partner or is at a certain rate or is it going to be the associate at a lower rate? Um, can you have a paralegal that reviews and summarizes the file at the least expensive rate? Um, you know, that can be an efficient way to handle things. Um, also talk to the lawyer. Matt brought up the scope of the work. Um, typically in litigation matters, the scope is going to be for a particular case. And then one question you may have is, is that lawyer going to represent you also in the appeal or are you going to be under a new fee agreement for the appeal? Typically we will handle a case to the end of the trial and have a new agreement. So we all start again at the same page with how we're going to handle an appeal, which is extremely different than a trial. They're, they're just day and night. Um, in terms of the work that is done um, by the lawyers, how it's done, everything about it is, is different. Um, one other thing, uh, just to keep in mind, um, you know, we do want to please you. We absolutely want to make sure our clients are happy. Um, so 
uh, just remember that this is a, a, something that can be discussed at the outset and you can reach a meeting of the minds and so don't be afraid to negotiate if you want to um, you know, for whatever it is that you may um, be concerned about in your particular case. And Cheryl, just as that, that was an excellent point you raised about asking whether paralegals or other professionals can do work that an attorney might otherwise be doing. And uh, I think some firms are really ahead of that and some firms are not. And it's, it's an excellent question that I've never been asked in the course of putting together an engagement letter with a client, but it, it's absolutely something that clients should be discerning of when they're shopping around for law firms. Yeah, thank you. We often do. And we will often stack a case, usually the client wants it, where in a particular case, they may want me, you know, or my partner, Lisa, handling the bulk of the case because it's a complex matter. And, you know, they want the head of the firm being, you know, handling it day to day. There are other cases where they are more comfortable with the junior associate handling the case and uh, myself supervising it or my partner, Lisa, supervising it. Very often they are very comfortable with having a paralegal. We have an excellent paralegal who just hired another full time that I mentioned earlier. Um, and very, very often they're really comfortable with having that person, that professional review and summarize the file. And that can be a very efficient way to go. Of course, the lawyer's gonna have to review it, but it's a lot less time consuming for the lawyer to review the summary than it is for the lawyer to review every single document. Awesome, awesome. And this brings us to the next point, um, different legal fee structures. So the fee structure for the relationship is typically included in the engagement letter as well. Here we have a few different fee structure options that a business owner may want to propose to a lawyer for a specific matter or representation. In a time where each dollar counts, unlike today, business owners should strongly consider proposing alternative fee structures to attorneys at the engagement letter stage to control costs. So Angela, what are some of the fee structure options at your firm? Is your firm offering any special services in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Well, we are, we are offering, as far as fee structures are concerned generally, um, I think everything on your list here, if I can just move my, my little box over, um, everything on your list here, uh, retainer, um, we usually do um, ask for a retainer um, at the outset of a relationship or at the outset of a, a matter or a case. Um, we, the barter system, I, I, so I don't much. think so, <laughs> no. Uh, we absolutely will uh, try to work with the client to design or create a projected budget um, if that makes the client feel more comfortable. And I think that is a, that's a benefit of going to um, a firm and going to a, a lawyer where you, what they're working on is their specialty. Um, so mm -hmm. it's easier and, and it's easier for them to project the budget because they've done this type of work many times before. Um, contingency fee usually is, uh, I, before I was a lawyer, another lifetime I worked at a, a plaintiff's personal injury firm. Uh, and that's where you will see contingency fees uh, most often. Um, if you are a, and we've all seen the commercials, we don't get paid unless you get paid type of thing. Um, that's not what typically you would see in a, a corporate fee agreement, um, such as, as what we would do. Um, but we do have other alternative fee arrangements, such as uh, fixed fees. Um, and this comes in uh, with the relationships, which I think we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, once you have developed a, a rapport with, uh, with, uh, with us or with the team of attorneys at the firm, um, or just know at the outset that, look, I've got a hundred different matters of this type and I need someone to handle it, um, rather than uh, doing a billable rate for each matter, we might uh, agree to something like a fixed fee or a flat rate for all of the matters of a similar type. Um, and so that is something that 
that we uh, will offer uh, and we'll discuss uh, when the circumstances are appropriate. I mean, that makes I'm sense. I'm sorry. It, yeah, and I wanted to talk about the COVID-19 also. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have um, special rates right now for COVID-19 uh, efforts. Um, we do have a, a COVID-19 task force um, that is specifically um, tasked with the, the responsibility of uh, really sifting through legislation that as we see changes almost daily, um, we see new updates and new orders from governors and from uh, mayors uh, in different uh, geographic areas um, in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, I myself spent the last, uh, spent several hours over the last few days updating Pencil our Pennsylvania uh, materials based on what the governor had announced um, at the beginning of this week. Um, and that's also a benefit of working with a mid-sized to large firm that has the resources to be able to uh, split the work up so that we have mm -hmm. right now associates and partners who are um, assigned to make sure that research and information is up to date in various, various geographic areas, not just the Pennsylvania area, which may impact um, your businesses depending on where you operate. Um, we also have on our website a uh, COVID-19 information page. If you go to the home page of our website at the very top, there's a link uh, that says exactly that COVID-19 information or COVID-19 resource page. Uh, and you can see various um, types of information there. Um, again, I'm not, we don't have necessarily um, a fee arrangement specifically for COVID-19 um, uh, uh, issues, uh, but still happy to talk about um, whatever types of uh, fee arrangements might be necessary based on what the client is dealing with, uh, given the current circumstances. Great, thanks, Angela. Is there anything that any other pan any of the other panelists want to add um, specifically uh, in res services or resources that your firm has available in response to the COVID-19 pandemic? I know we are putting out client alerts as quickly as we can digest everything that's coming out of the, of the various state federal agencies. You know, the, the Senate passed a bill last night. I know, I think it was like two in the morning. Um, I know because I was changing my infant son's diaper at the time and my phone buzzed. It was the Wall Street Journal telling me that the law had passed. Uh, the House is taking it up uh, tomorrow, I believe. So I imagine there are a lot of firms including <laughs> going to be publishing on that. Um, but it certainly, this goes to the client alert point that we discussed before. I mean, this is where you, you can find someone who'd be able to help you get a read about what firms are writing regarding COVID-19. Are, are they anticipating issues that are going to impact your particular business? Now, those are the folks that you want to reach out to. Um, on COVID-19, just wanted to encourage everyone um, to follow me on LinkedIn. I have been posting repeatedly on LinkedIn. It's completely free um, and you can follow my posts and um, get the information. But the first post I did, these are on leadership in this time of COVID-19, was about um, the latest guidelines in addition to the self-distancing and the washing of hands. Um, I got guidelines from Gilda Kramer, who is a commissioner in rural areas that was advising about what do you do when you get your mail? Um, what do you do with your non-perishables and with your fruits and vegetables and things like that? So um, I posted that. That was my first leadership post about this uh, situation. And since I've been posting as well, most of my posts are about equity, equality, diversity, and inclusion, which is a huge passion of mine and my law firm. It's a core value of our firm. So a lot of these posts are about how companies can ramp up their diversity efforts which is incredibly important, especially at this time. Um, diversity and inclusion and difference of opinion and perspective actually increases innovation and increases creativity, which are two of the resources we absolutely need the most to figure out strategies and tools to combat this crisis and any crisis that we can face. So I really encourage you all 
just go to LinkedIn, type in Cheryl L. Axelrod and follow me. There's over 2,000 people that have so far. Um, and you can just follow my posts. And if you like them, please uh, hit like and comment on them. And the more you do, the more people will see them and be able to follow them. Well, thanks, Cheryl. We had one question about um, the billable hour, getting a quick summation of what that means, what do the six minute increments mean, so on and so forth. Uh, Matt, do you mind answering that question really quickly before we continue? Sure, uh, not at all. Um, most law firms, large law firms, will bill hours in six minute increments, tenths of an hour. For some type of work, we do bill in quarter of an hour, but I've only done that once in, in the three years I've been a, a drinker, now, now Fagri drinker. Um, we do have a program, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you in behind the, behind the curtain here. We do have a program that allows us to track in real time the amount of time that we, we spend on matters. So it's, it's not just guesswork. I mean, there is some precision to it. But of course, it, we have a gestalt sense of how much something should cost. So if, if something should have taken two hours, but you know, we weren't so efficient, it took three, you know, we'll, we'll kind of eat that time. Um, you know, again, that's, that's you know, hush, 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 not for, not for further discussion outside of this webinar. Um, but unfortunately, the profession, at least insofar as larger firms are concerned, we just haven't figured out a way to get around it. I mean, these, these six options for fee structures that Tariq has put on this slide, our firm is almost completely locked into the billable hour, which is unfortunate, but until we can collectively figure out a better way around it, it's, it's the six minute increment. Mm hmm understood understood so next i just wanted to run through some quick tips for the engagement letter um we've hinted on many of them throughout the uh, panelists pre presentations but just to run through them really quickly make sure you narrowly tailor how the services will be performed and state how changes in the scope of work will be handled um you also want to clearly define the fee and how those fees will be paid and also consider actions that will need your consent before being taken and state them in the letter for example filings um, if you want them to reach out to counsel outside of their law firm that's a specialist for a particular matter um, even if there's a situation where your billing rate is going to change because you've been on a particular matter for so long that the firm itself is es actually escalating its rates, say, to keep up with um, cost of living, just as an example. Those are things that you might want to put in your engagement letter is, I need consent before some of these things happen. Um, there will also be some of the standard provisions, such as limitations of liability, dispute resolution, um, maintaining the privacy and maintaining the attorney-client privilege. Um, you business owners retaining any ownership of intellectual property um, and confidentiality. I think not not to interrupt you, Tariq, but I think mm -hmm. these six items will have varying degrees of importance depending on the type of matter you're you're working on. So for a you know, a tax matter, if it's, if we're delivering an opinion on a particular transaction, it's, it's very easy to narrowly tailor and, and state the fees, and there's not going to be much in the way of changes to the work or anything four to six, but and I'm, Cheryl can probably speak to this, if, if it's a litigation matter or an IP matter, all of these are going to be important. Mm -hmm. Exactly right, exactly right. Great. So next we start to discuss the attorney relationship. Once a lawyer has been researched and a business owner has decided to work with the attorney, executed the engagement letter, so on and so forth, chances are if that attorney has performed well and you did proper research and diligence, you'll want to work with that attorney on a recurring basis. Note, however, that some lawyers and law firms may be better suited for certain matters based on what we described earlier in the presentation, for example, uh, compared to other matters. It is recommended that business owners seek to grow their legal teams or specialists in each legal area of need 
as the business becomes more complex and grows. I mean, as matters arise, you, could, you can continue to use the same attorneys, your relationship should strengthen, and you'll be able to develop a, a better bond and a deeper relationship with the attorney that you use. Um, I've included some thoughts and ideas about the benefits of developing a relationship with an attorney opposed to an engaging attorney for a single matter and hopping from attorney to attorney as matters arise. Um, things such as they can develop a deeper understanding of your business um, to the attorney themselves being more willing to share some of their own resources because of the relationship that you've developed. Um, I'm going to start with Matt for this one. Matt, in your practice, do you work on multiple matters with one client or do you work on a single matter? And if it's a mix of single matters and on multiple matters for a particular client, what percentage can you attribute to that? Sure. I do both. Um, so for the like-kind exchange transactions that I work on, we have several clients who are uh, trying to explain this in English. Translating tax to English isn't always easy. But this particular client fulfills the same role in a bunch of different like-kind exchanges for recurring clients and new clients. So he refers to us any kind of transaction that has a unique tweak or something that's not really plain vanilla. And we've done, oh gosh, maybe 20 transactions with him in the role of like an outside counsel consultant. Uh, and the, the good part about that is we know what his quirks are. We, we know things that, um, that he's likely to overlook. Uh, we know things that um, we've, we've done in other transactions that will work um, for him. Um, when we do work with um, some of our private equity clients, they, um, they acquire portfolio companies. And a lot of times they acquire portfolio companies who have state tax compliance histories that aren't great. So when we acquire, work with a client to acquire the company, that's when I come in and I start working with the portfolio company to get its, its state tax obligations kind of into line. Um, and then when the private equity fund is ready to sell the portfolio company, I kind of serve the, the role of defending the compliance work that we've done. So when the buyer says, well, did you look at this? Did you think of that? What is this thing that we found in the diligence process? I can say, yeah, yeah you know, I was the person that tied up all those loose ends. And, and here you, you can take a look at the record and you'll see that everything is in place. So you know, that's something that you don't have to be indemnified for. You know, we're not going to lower the purchase price because there are some possible state tax issue. And that's the benefit of having a lawyer who's been involved cradle to grave with those kinds of issues is we can really be a strong advocate when, when it matters most. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I completely understand that. And that, so now I'll move to Angela and Cheryl. I'm going to ask both of you guys the same question. Um, well, a different question, but I want you to both answer this question that I'm asking. Um, how does building a relationship with your client help you provide more effective service to that client? And how does the client even benefit from you providing a higher level of service? You want to start, Angela, and then I'll go after you? Yeah, well, I'll start with Angela, sorry. Okay, sure. <clears throat> so we have, um, we have a saying or a slogan, uh, if you will, at Saul Ewing that says, our client's business is our business. Um, and, and basically that is what we, what we use to, as a driving force for our work, no matter what client we're working with, no matter what matter we're working on. Um, and, and it underscores the understanding that we have um, of the simple truth that it, the, the more we understand the client, the way that the client operates um, and the client's business overall, the better prepared and the better equipped we are uh, to offer them top-notch service. Um, if you think about, again, by way of analogy, if you think about your relationship with other professionals, like a doctor, uh, you could as a one-off go to a doctor with a certain specialty for a certain type of problem. But if you have a, a one physician that you see consistently over the course of many years, 
over the course of many generations even in certain families, how much better prepared is that physician to address your needs, to understand the, the workings of what might be going on, your history, your personal history, your family history. Um, if you think about that in terms of a company, uh, certainly we are smart, we're diligent, we work hard and we can get up to speed very quickly if we have to. Uh, but if, if, if there is a longstanding relationship that we've been able to get to know the client over a longer period of time, then when something comes up, we're that much better prepared to answer questions uh, and to address it in a way that is not cookie cutter. Uh, not that we're using the same approach for every client just because the case looks the same, um, but really addressing and approaching and crafting our strategy based on the particular client that we're working for. Um, so that's the benefit for the client. Uh, at, at the outset with the particular matters. And then over the course of time, uh, we really do our best to keep in touch with clients even when we don't have an active matter in front of us. Um, we, uh, Matt mentioned client alerts. Uh, that's something that we do our best to, uh, to send out, not just weekly, uh, but maybe quarterly and, and even if it's not time necessarily for a client alert to go out, if I read an article or hear of a case that I know directly impacts the client's industry, I'll just shoot them an email and say, hey, I'm not, not sure if you heard about this, uh, but you might want to know about this new development in the law that that mm -hmm. really might have an impact on the way that you do your day to day business. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's the real benefit. And I I really can't stress enough how, how important it is and how beneficial it is uh, to, to work with the same attorney over and over again, even if, as you said, Sharik, you have multiple attorneys who handle different types of matters or specialties for you because you have different needs, um, still engaging with those same set of attorneys uh, over the course of a long period of time is a great idea. Yeah, just um, sure. building, on, building on what Matt and Angela said, and there were great points, um, to give you kind of an example of this kind of thing. So uh, my firm's been around for 13 years, and I've been practicing for, for 27. Um, and we have long-standing clients that we've worked with for, you know, throughout our history. So for instance, with one, um, when I get an employment file from them, I will get it from the, uh, someone in their HR department, Human Resources, I know who I need to talk to about any aspect of the case because I've been dealing with this client for a long time. So if I need to know about um, their pay history, there's someone I need to speak to and I know who that is. If I need to know about um, security at the building, um, there's someone else I need to talk to and I know who that is. Um, if I wanna find out what my authority is to negotiate a settlement in this case or whether I'm going to be going to trial, and whether I'm going to be doing depositions, and if so, of who. That's someone else, and I know who to speak to. And it's not just who I know to speak to, but it's the fact that we've been speaking for, for years, and we know how each other thinks, how and how each other works, and it's so seamless, because we've gotten to know each other so well, and the trust is so strong that, mm -hmm. for instance, um, they'll pick up the phone and call me for matters outside of what I do, um, because they trust me and they know that either I'll handle it because I'm able to, or I will refer it out and I'll get them the right person uh, to really appropriately handle their needs. So that long standing relationship and trust, I, I cannot underscore it enough. Um, one of the things I mentioned to you, Tariq, um, when we spoke privately, is a client of mine went through a matter in which one of the um, embezzling money from them okay so that's obviously a crisis and uh, the authorities went and um, arrested her and so my client went to me it was a nonprofit in this situation asking what do we do because what they most most wanted to make sure to do and of course I knew this because I know this client I've been working with them for so long is ensure the community they are on the community side and they want to do everything in the best interest of their community. So the first thing we talked about was cooperating with the authorities and preparing a press statement that would go out to the community and let them know what they were doing. And through each phase of 
this individual's arrest, from her arrest to the investigation of what she had done, which we fully cooperated in and gave them all the documents that we had um, because we had just recently found out about it and gone to the authorities with it, um, to her uh, being charged, to her um, making a, a, entering into a plea, being guilty uh, to certain things. There are there's still other things that are ongoing in this. Um, I've been helping them through each step of the way. And in fact, it's been um, a situation in which the community, as I understand it, is donating even more to my client because they see that my client is a victim of all of this. Mm -hmm. um, so that long-standing relationship has incredible benefits that go so far beyond the handling of any single case. And that's a good, I like that example, Cheryl. Thanks for, thank you for sharing that because that is a direct tangible benefit from establishing that attorney client relationship on an ongoing basis. I mean, that wasn't, that was something that your long standing client reached out to you probably because they just didn't even know how to handle it. I mean, a nonprofit where every dollar counts going or experiencing one of its employees embezzling funds from it and then having to deal with the public perception of that where and most for those most nonprofits, their reputation is everything. And then being able to work with you to execute a plan to mitigate any fallout from that becoming public. And it actually seemed like it helped the client because they were then able to attract more interest and in don donations as a result. So I'm going to just go to our next slide in the interest of time because I do want to also include some time for our guests to ask questions. When we move to the question section of the presentation, um, guests, you'll be able to chat your question into the chat box that is on the right side of your um, toolbar. And then we'll receive the question and we'll ask the question to the panelists. You can ask that question to any panelist or you can direct it to a specific panelist um, if you need to. But now we're going to quickly shift focus to managing the attorney-client relationship during the particular matter. Some of these strategies may help keep legal costs down and will also help the attorney help you and enable them to provide more effective counsel. Um, we've already shared some of those examples um, on a previous slide. I usually would also remind business owners that lawyers can only help you with the issues that they know about. So I strongly advise you to keep your lawyer as informed as possible. The more he or she knows, the better she, he or she is able to help you. So some of the other tips that we have include keeping the attorney updated on business changes related to the particular subject matter expertise for that lawyer. Um, and as you build that relationship, you'll also have the lawyer sending you information, as Angela mentioned, um, when there are changes in the law that are relevant to how you conduct business on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, though you should conduct initial research to be able to focus your question to an attorney. If you come to an attorney with a broad question like, hey, I have this issue, help me out, they may take a little longer to arrive at the answer that you're looking for. Whereas if you've kind of done some research and really are able to narrow the question that you have, it's a greater chance, not a definite, but it may be a greater chance that they'll arrive at a, a direct answer to you quickly, um, if not be able to just answer your question right during the call. Um, do not reinvent the wheel with each assignment. Um, I'm speaking, this tip is more from a transactional standpoint. Most, law, most transactional lawyers, um, I consider myself a transactional lawyer as well. We tend to have boiler uh, template documents that we can kind of finesse and massage to fit a wide variety of situations. And if you've been working with a lawyer for some time, chances are they have already established templates that include certain provisions and employment contracts, service agreements, um, some of the routine agreements that you enter into on a day-to-day -day basis. They probably already baked those into a form so that whenever you need a new one produced, it doesn't 
involve them starting at square one, but they'll be able to take that form, tailor it to the specific circumstance that is needed for, and then produce you a finished product um, at a faster speed. And then lastly, also ask about resources and connections that you might want to, that your lawyer might want to share with you. Um, that'll be a very important thing too, and it further extends your network. So while you're going to your lawyer asking for one question, if they can't help you, but they'll provide resources or connections, something that Cheryl mentioned as well, um, it's beneficial to, to you to at least have that trusted guidance and support um, with your issue as it arises. Um, is there anything else that any of the other panelists want to add? Maybe like one tip that a business owner could implement immediately to maximize the attorney-client relationship and help you better help your client? And if the answer is no, that's okay. But I just figured I'd give you guys a chance to, to speak on that. I would just say, I do want to, oh no, go ahead, Angela. Sorry. Um, I want to mention one thing, and I'm not sure if this gets into the next thing that we're going to talk about, um, which, where we might be on it already, so I'm just going to say it now. Um, don't wait until there's a problem to talk to your lawyer. Uh, we, as I said earlier, one of the things, especially in a litigation context, uh, that we like to do for our clients is not just address the current lawsuit that you're, you're facing, which obviously we want to handle the best way that we can and in a, in a, uh, have an outcome that's great for the client, but we also want to take preventative measures to make sure that you have policies and procedures and best practices in place in order to avoid problems down the road. Um, so just don't wait until that lawsuit is filed. Don't wait until that subpoena is issued from the prosecutor's office. Uh, don't wait until the, the, the W-2 issue shows up, like Matt mentioned before. Talk to your lawyer about best practices and things that you can do while things are great in order to make sure that things continue that way. Yeah, awesome. That's that's an excellent point. And to that, and one tidbit I was going to share that I, that I mentioned before, and, and Tariq, this gets to your question of, can you provide an example of a client having to spend more money to fix an issue that could have been avoided if they'd called the lawyer at the outset? And what would have it, I recently had just that very experience. Um, this was with an out-of-state real estate developer that was selling um, a interest in a, in a joint venture that owned Philadelphia real estate. Um, and as anybody who's experienced Philadelphia Realty Transfer Tax knows, if you sell uh, more than 75% of an interest in a company that owns real estate, um, you're, you've got a Realty Transfer Tax obligation. And the client came to us after the purchase agreement had been signed. And had we been able to talk to them at the outset, we could have structured the transaction in a way such that the realty transfer tax was completely avoided. And it was like $125,000 worth of tax. And it certainly wouldn't have cost us $125,000 to come up with the alternative structure. And I, by, that, by the time we got it, the closing was, it was imminent and there would have been no way to unwind the transaction. So we were stuck with it, but yeah, a stitch in time saves time. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add, I completely agree with what they said, and I'm going to add the flip of that, meaning the mirror opposite. At the end of litigation, you want to talk to uh, your, your lawyer, and hopefully your lawyer is going to proactively do this, and do a 180 degree look back and say to you, what could have been done here to avoid this in the future? So one of the things I mentioned I do is, for instance, bodily injury defense work for companies. So if your company has someone who suffers an injury and the company sues, it is always a good idea to look back, not even at the end of the litigation, but you can do it early on and think about, could better procedures have been put in place here so that we can prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future? Um, that's always a good idea. In employment litigation, very similar questions. Are there different policies, different procedures, and different training 
that could have happened here that could have prevented this? And if so, can we put them in place now so that we don't have this thing happen in the future or far worse? So uh, just to give an example of a horrific incident, um, but we had a situation where one of our clients had somebody in, who was a supervisor who um, was allegedly uh, telling, and, and I'm past the statute of limitations, even if you could figure out who I'm talking about, but was allegedly telling um, women who were um, in need of uh, shelter that I'll give you the shelter if, if you have sex with me, basically, and give me sexual favors. And the boss of that person was not reporting him because supposedly that person was addicted to oxycodone, which is another you know, national um, tragedy going on in this country. It's an epidemic. And so the person allegedly telling these women that they could stay if they had sex with him was blackmailing his boss saying, if you tell on me, I'm going to tell everyone that you're getting your oxycodone from the residents. So um, supposedly there were many, many women that were impacted. So there was, of course, a big discussion about how do we put better policies and better procedures in place so that this never happens at any of your facilities ever again. Um, we managed to do that. We managed to contain the crisis. There was only one um, lawsuit ever brought. Um, but this kind of thing is critically important to um, make sure to have a lawyer that, you're, that is doing this for you. And if they're not already automatically doing it, make sure to bring it up so that they do. Mm, thanks, Cheryl. And then that's a good point because that shows how a business invested up front in a lawyer was able to mitigate risk and prevent itself from spending way more money down the line and Matt's example um, mentioned that too, where they spent would have spent way more money down the line trying to remedy this, um, as opposed to spending that money up front and getting some counseling on the front end and establishing those procedures. Yes, and as Angela said, that the you know thinking up front and figuring out, you know, talking to your lawyer first before you make decisions is also a great idea too. Absolutely. So I think that one final business consideration um, is budgeting for legal spend. Your business has to operate in accordance with uh, any applicable law and managing legal risk should be an ongoing business process. It's not a one-time thing when an issue arises. As the business takes on new business, hires and lets go of employees and also implements and constructs its strategic plans, I think that it makes sense for owners to work with their attorneys to mitigate legal risk, get feedback on those plans before they're implemented, and make sure that the policies, procedures, and plans that they are looking to um, execute are in accordance with any uh, applicable laws. So one statistic that I found was that companies of all sizes spend an average of 0.4% of its total revenue on legal services in 2018. So, I mean, you're talking about 0.4% of total revenue. I mean, it seems like a pretty small number to invest in ongoing um, compliance and, uh, and working with your attorney on an ongoing basis to make sure you're operating uh, within the boundaries of the law. Another thing that a business owner may want to look to to establish a legal budget is this legal spend in prior years. Um, if you look at two or three years and then take the average, it may make sense to make that average the budget for legal for forward for years moving forward and then you can adjust it as needed. But at least you're planning from um, an operation budget standpoint on incorporating that in so that you don't have to stress your cash flow to uh, have those costs or pay those costs down the line. Um, litigation history and risk. If you are in a, an industry that is typically litigious or if you're say like a property owner and people commonly 
to you because they slipped and fell on your property, that's something that you may want to consider when you're establishing this legal budget. And lastly, a range. So you may want to fit into your budget five to 10,000, or you can go as uh, specific as a fixed number and then work that into your budget. The point is you'll be better able to invest in the in your business and making sure that is operating within um, a applicable law if you plan ahead for spending that money. Next, we just have a list of top 10 tips for working with lawyers. Um, be efficient with time because lawyers do bill hourly in most cases. Plan ahead for your meetings with lawyers. Give a lawyer a heads up about issues. That's something that I think all of our panelists mentioned. And also keep them informed on things that you're thinking about doing with the business. Uh, seek advice at the beginning. So don't take an action and then ask a lawyer to help you unwind it or get yourself out of it. But consult a lawyer before you actually take that step. Lose your, use your lawyer's contacts and knowledge. Um, we went through that a lot today. Make sure you follow through and follow up. Um, if you are going to tell your lawyer, hey, I have this new issue that I'm thinking about. I want to schedule a call at six, but in advance, I'm going to send you an outline of what I'm thinking. Send that outline because chances are the lawyer is going to review it and be much better prepared for the call or meeting that you're having in the future. Um, also, set agendas for meetings. You can drive the bus in a meeting and just walk through your agenda and make sure you're hitting all of the points that you need, which typically in all meetings um, tend to make them more efficient. Be upfront about legal fees. And then lastly, think big. So think big about your strategic vision for your business. Um, make sure you mention your strategic vision to your attorney so that way they're better able to help you think through any issues that can arise as you execute that vision. So we're at the end of the presentation. I wanted to leave a few minutes for, for our attendees to ask questions. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat box. We'll, I'll read them off and then I'll direct them to the attorney that you wanna ask the question to. So I'll give you a few more minutes. Um, the presentation is going to end at 7.30. Yes, you will get a copy of the slides. I believe that we'll also make the slides available on PIDC's website, uh, www.pidcphila.com. So I have a one question um, asking if we could talk more about the consent notice, how you approach it, how we manage it. Could you establish a budget, a legal spend budget and ask for notification if that gets off track? Um, fee misunderstandings have broken many attorney relationships for this particular uh, asker and has led them to make tough business decisions. So does anyone want to tackle that? Like, how do you approach and manage the, the consents that you want, that a business owner wants before a lawyer takes a particular action? How do you manage that conversation? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, regard, and I'll go to the second part of the question, um, budgeting and, and keeping track of fees and fee misunderstandings. Uh, the best thing to do is to have a frank conversation at the outset about what it is you're willing to spend to see a matter through. And the attorney also has to be honest and forthcoming about whether that budget is reasonable. Um, I'll give you an example. We are helping some of our transactional clients in a litigation in a state tax matter. And they've <laughs> clients are less willing to spend money on litigation than they are to not have to pay taxes which i've noticed um so we set a budget at the at the outset and we've, we're communicating with them monthly 
on where we are in terms of various cost components of it. So you know, the discovery phase costs this much, the expert's gonna cost this much, this is where we are. So everybody feels like we're on the same page. So you know, there, there won't be surprises if things were to become more expensive. You know, being open and having conversations at each stage, maybe even having you know, monthly conversations about bills is probably the best way to stay on top of that with the understanding that budgets are often going to change. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Matt. We have, a, we have another question. Um, so we have a, this question is actually for you, Matt. Oh. Um, a realtor wants to know how they should, I guess, plan their expenses as they're just starting out in the, in the profession of selling real estate to um, set aside funds for any tax liability in the future. Do you have any suggestions on, on like a ballpark that they should set aside and where should they put it? Yeah, so if you're a startup realtor and you're, and forgive me, I don't know much about how that space operates, but if you are not an employee, you're going to be self-employed, you're gonna to have to make estimated tax payments. Um, and you're, you're probably looking at a situation where maybe your, your tax obligations are going to outpace your, your cash inflows. Um, just try to set aside as much as you can so that you're consistent with your estimated tax. Obligation. I have not looked through the Senate legislation closely, so I don't know if there have been changes to deadlines for making estimated payments um, in that sense, but uh, that, that could be part of the relief package um, that the Senate's come up with, as opposed to how you keep money set aside with everything going on with COVID-19. I mean, banks and U.S. Treasuries, that's where we would recommend people to put money at this moment. Mm. If I can just add to that briefly, um, there are, as Matt, as Matt stated, there are not just tax relief efforts at the federal level, but also in the state level. So make sure that you um, are abreast of whatever measures are being taken, whatever laws are being passed, whatever um, uh, relief is being offered at the state level um, in, in the way of tax benefits given the, the COVID-19 um, uh, situation. That's good to know. So that's something that you guys may want to look into for sure. Um, I have two more questions. How does an out-of-state business owner know how to find an excellent real estate attorney if they are entering the local market for the first time? Can I, can I give a tip? Sure, sure. So I mentioned NAMWOLF, the National Association of Minority and Women-Owned Law Firms, um, which are some of the finest firms across the country. They have to have all these criteria satisfied that I mentioned. You can go to the NAMWOLF website, www.namwolf.org, and you can search us by state, by city, by specialty, like practice area. Um, so that's another great way to find a fabulous lawyer. Um, these other two panelists are in larger firms, and they're great. Um, Angela had two of her partners appear in front of me when I was serving as a, a judge pro tempore, helping them resolve a dispute. Um, they were terrific, um, represented their clients extremely well. And you can see from Matt that he really knows his stuff. So um, these are other firms to go to as well. So there's some great resources out there to find yourself um, these kinds of lawyers. And if their firms, um, you know, if they can't reach a fee agreement that makes sense for your company and NAMWOLF can't, the other question is, as I said before, ask lawyers. So ask them who they would recommend. Um, so I recently asked for a, a client out of, our, out of our practice area where to go. And I went to the lawyers that I thought would help them. And those lawyers were priced too high for them. Um, but they had a great recommendation and the client's thrilled with the lawyer that they got. So that's another way to go about it. Great, great. I think that's great advice. One more question that we have is could a tax, and I think this one is directed to Matt as well, could a tax lawyer aid with bankruptcy and collections issues? Bankruptcy 
probably not. I mean, bankruptcy is its own specialization and mm-hmm. it actually has its own court system um, to deal with bankruptcy issues. Um, there are tax issues that come up in the bankruptcy context with respect to when forgiveness of certain loans doesn't have to be considered for tax purposes. So you may want to have a tax specialist weigh in on that if that's part of your, your fact set. Uh, regarding collections, there are, are, there are tax lawyers that deal with IRS collections matters. So they will represent a taxpayer when the IRS is attempting to seize property. And it's not as if the, the IRS can send you a deficiency notice and then just take your car or take your house. There's a very elaborate process that has to be gone through before the IRS can seize property. So a tax lawyer would be able to help with that. Can I make a quick recommendation? Sure. Sure. Um, For the collection lawyer, Drew Salaman is, um, if he's still practicing and just check, uh, S-A-L-A-M-A-N, Drew Salaman. Um, He's really good. And I have uh, referred folks to him in the past. Great. Thanks for that. So I think that those are all of the questions that I see. Um, And we're coming on the end of our time. I want to thank our very knowledgeable and accomplished panelists for joining us today. Um, Thank you to Shane, Marla, Stanley, Jasmine, the PIDC crew for supporting this webinar and getting it out to the participants. And I hope that um, all of the participants enjoy and learn some very valuable and important information because it's hard to find a lawyer and figure all this out when a matter arises and you're under pressure in the deadline. So it's better to kind of have these, this, these tips and strategies in your back pocket so that in the event that you do have to engage a lawyer in a time sensitive man, manner, you at least have um, some tools under your belt to, to employ. But I think also, as you are just out networking and conducting business, it's always valuable to establish relationships with lawyers that you encounter um, on every day or a regular basis. So I think that is it for us. Um, thank you again, guys. Thank you for your time and um, good luck for sure because as we said at the beginning, we are definitely in challenging times now. I hope everyone stays safe, use the hand sanitizer, um, things of that nature. So great. Thank you, everyone, and uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Thank you. Thank you to you, Tariq, and for having us. No problem. Thank you.